going to make a formal introduction of him. And his presentation is going to be discussed by Mr. Goldberg Mushabe, the Executive Director of Bangkok. We shall also make some formal introduction of him. Then we are going to later on have an overview of corruption in Uganda by General Salim Saleh, is on the way coming. Then we shall open a debate where all of us are going to take part in this discussion. Uh, I can see some people out there, we have some seats here. They should And Anthony, how they? Then we have also uh, some kind of uh, presentation which we shall make towards the end of the views by the academic staff of Matthew University Business School on the subject. We have an online discussion which we usually hold as a, a preamble to this formal uh, public lecture by uh, distinguished people here. <coughs> Uh, Economic Forum of Moves was founded in July 2011. It's now almost two years, nearly two years old. And we have a vision of trying to fashion an inclusive think tank that supports transformation of Uganda. And our mission is to cause debate and general solutions to Uganda's economic challenges. We have set all, uh, quite a number of goals, but uh, in the interest of time, I will take you through a few of them. We intend to conduct research, research and generate economic policy papers, which also we are going to publish and be available for the public consumption. We also hold public forums like this one, where we come and discuss some of the topical issues and the policy issues within the country. We tend also to build the capacity of staff and students of Macquarie University Business School, as well as the general public in economic matters. We have a board of the economic forum, which is chaired by the principal of Macquarie University Business School, Professor Wasora Winua. And it has several members. Professor Maggie Chigozi, she's a member. Mr. Charles Simbile, the chairman of MTN, is a member. Dr. Mohamed Serujoji, former Bank of Uganda director, is a member. Dr. Polika Kusinguzi, also former Chief Economist at the Bank of Uganda is a member. Dr. Nicodemus Rudahirana, who is a professor of economics here, is a member. Uh, Mr. Bernard Wabukala, uh, who is a lecturer of economics from Makere University Business School, and myself, also a lecturer here. We have held seven public uh, forums before, and this is the end. We have initiated the debates on critical economic issues, uh, just for the interest or benefit of a few who may need to know about a few of them. We initiated a debate on the effectiveness of Bank of Uganda's monetary policy on credit markets in Uganda. Dr. Adam Mugume came here, presented uh, the, the, the view of the Bank of Uganda, challenged it. And it initiated some good debate, which is still ongoing, on how we can make Bank of Uganda effective in especially reducing these lending rates. Rural development finance also and value chain in Uganda. It's now a debate which is going on. The uh, intention is to, to, for example, revive cooperatives. And uh, we have had a hand in that. Uh, General Saleh was previously here and presented to us the Akiba model, which uh, with the African Development Bank, which was also available here, we made a way forward on how 
to take the rural development finance forward. So a number of debates have taken place and uh, we have helped one or another, the country, to, to, to start talking about some of these issues. Today we are delighted to have uh, two distinguished uh, presenters. We have uh, our key not speaker today is going to be Dr. John Mutenio, is a doctor of economics and is a senior lecturer at Makere University. He holds a PhD from the University of Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, in economics. He has an MA in economic policy and planning from Makere University. He recently was a fellow, a research fellow at a Brookings Institution in the African Growth Initiative, uh, the Global Economy and Development in Washington, D.C., where he did his post-doctoral uh, research. He was also a visiting scholar at the International Monetary Fund in Washington, D.C. He's a well-known economist here. He has taught nearly a three quarters of the economists in this country. He has taught all of us economics, right from those value classes where we are today. So we are so delighted, sir, to have you today to discuss this noble uh, topic. It's going to be discussed, this presentation will be discussed by uh, Mr. Godibat Mushabe, who is the executive director of our court. <coughs> Mr. Mushabe is a trained lawyer. He received his first degree and a master's in law from Makere University. So he has two masters because he also holds another master's degree in, in a jurisdictional kind of sciences from Stanford University. You know these terms of uh, law, they are quite interesting. <laughs> Mr. Kumashab is also uh, currently pursuing a doctoral in the same at the Stanford Law School in the United States of America, one of the most distinguished universities you know. All of us know here. He teaches law at Makere University and he attended the Ford Foundation Fellowship in Environmental Politics at the Institute of International Studies, University of California in Berkeley uh, between 2007 and 9. And also he was a fellow in the Stanford program in international law at the Stanford Law School there. So we have two of the finest brains in this country to, 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 to share with us some of the views pertaining to the topic we have today. Yeah, we have very limited time. Both of them are very busy people. You know, getting smart people for an hour is a privilege enough. So I will invite the head of department, my boss at, at, at Makere University Business School, to give us some few welcome remarks, and as well invite the key not speaker to present his paper. I thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ramadan. Thank you, dear manager. You're all welcome to our eighth economic forum. We are happy to see this room full at this time and more people coming in. I hope we need to move the forum. It's our wish and ambition to move it from the boardroom of Makemba Business School to a public place where we can have as many people as possible because we want to cause change. You know, change begins with you and we believe that change begins with the business school. We want to make a contribution to this country because that's part of our responsibility by creating a think tank about economic issues because we believe that academicians have a role to play in this economy. And we are so happy to have you here. This is, we are almost making two years in July and we are proud to say that we've made various achievements. When we discussed inflation, I know that Bank of Uganda was moved and made changes. And we hope that we continue causing change in this country. You're welcome to this eighth economic forum. And allow me to 
invite Dr. Mtenyi to make his presentation. Dr. Mtenyi has made a great contribution to this country. He taught me economics, and I was so happy to have him again here as our key discussant. Dr. Mtenyi, you're very welcome. So we don't um, watch and on each other like that. And recently, we were tasked to revive the Ghana Economic Society with him. So we are on the same board of reviving the Economic Society. So recently, when we were chatting, it happened, I think, about a week or two ago, takes an invitation to me to come and talk about this topic. I was not a committer because I had a very, very busy show. It's actually, I, until this, the reason I confirmed that I would be coming. Because I began working on this piece that's in the last year. Saturday, I'm working on this piece. It's extremely busy. But in, all in all, I'm glad I'm here. Now, my apologies, the very first place for not being able to make the slides for PowerPoint. It's not the way I always do my presentations. It was my very first time to be perhaps at the presentation in the world. So kindly bear with me once I just finished. Put off my hands there some minutes ago on this piece of work. All in all, I can hope the message shall be passed on. Okay. The topic, as you know, corruption in Uganda, corruption in Africa, is not an easy topic to talk about. It. However, we have to talk about it. Okay? We have to talk about it because of the costs that are involved in corruption. So we have to talk about it. So my presentation, I must talk about it. Let's see my phone goes. I last met him in Washington when we came to for some reason. Uh, my presentation is going to flow as you know. I talk about I'm giving the definition of corruption, which I think I may be all known. And then talk briefly about the model of corruption. Then I also talk about corruption and organization of government. I will brief there. Then we shall give have some figures on the trend of corruption in Uganda and probably the world over. And then we shall talk about the causes. And then corruption and efficiency, this is some sort of the benefits of corruption. But anything bad also has both cause and the benefits. Then shall we talk about the costs of corruption and the policy issues to deal with corruption. So my discussion is basically general. It may not focus specifically on Uganda, but you can pick something out of it. So I begin with the introduction. With the introduction, uh, corruption indeed occurs all over the world. Of course, it's mostly pronounced on developing countries. 
<laughs> uh, indeed, those who pay and receive rights export to the national wealth, living to the relative of the poorest. That's one major problem we have in Africa. You can touch it. Find somebody taking a billion plus, meant for a marine treatment, and the rest are left without anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So very little Europe is left. Now, to explain corruption, we basically use what you call the principal agent theory. The principal is the government. Government appoints a civil servant who is now the agent to do some tasks. And of course, government pays the agent. Then there is a private individual, you and I, the businessman and so forth. So corruption basically means, I mean, it's, it is between the three and probably middle person who tries to connect the private individual to the agent to extend what? The so it's the principal agent theory. Okay. Where the principal is government, the agent is the public servant, and the individual or is it the private person who actually does the payment to it of the bribe? And it can be a person or a farm or anything. Okay? I'm sorry, this is since late, so the wrong question is I'm going to explain as to what? How for it? Kindly bear with me. Okay? Kindly bear with me. Okay? Um, in, uh, all in the all, uh, payments are corrupt uh, when they are illegally made to the public agents with the goal of obtaining benefit or avoiding the cost. Okay? Because such payments affect the behavior of both the payers and the recipients. The recipient, that's the agent, is supposed to do his task. That's the principle. Who, who were for the government uh, assigned him. But when he begins involving himself in corruption, it becomes a habit. So his behavior now changes. Instead of performing his tasks, he's always waiting for something first. Similarly, the agent, rather, the private individual, also gets uh, inclined to pay bribes all the time. So as to expect what the service will be done. So this issue now affects both the agent and the person paying the bribe. Now we come to the definition. So generally, for the, uh, corruption refers to the use of public office for private gains. They're using public office for the private gains. Okay? That's how briefly I can explain what, what the corruption is. So specifically, it is the illegal payment made by an agent in order to extract or attain a benefit or avoid the cost. As I said earlier, it involves the giver, who is now the private individual, and the receiver, who is the agent. Which agent is best kind of public servant? Okay. Now we talk about models of corruption. Now best kind of two. How about you call corruption with theft and corruption without theft? What does this mean? Now with this, I mean regarding corruption with theft, in this case price is paid. I mean the price that is paid equals to the brain which may be below the official price. So the only tax to government is diverted to the individual. Yet the cost to the official or the agent is zero. This form of corruption is widespread, particularly at the custom colleagues. What are we talking about here? You are supposed to pay 100,000 as the official tax. 
Now the agent talks to the individual or the private individual. Or the private individual or other talks to the agent who wants to pay this and that. So instead of paying, of paying 100,000, he or she pays 70,000. Officially, the private individual takes 5,000 to the government and he or she pockets what? 2,000. So this is what we call corruption with theft. So government does not receive actually what is supposed to, to receive. Part of this, I mean, the customer official undervalues the tax and he gives part, he takes part of it and he gives government just a portion. Then another form or model is corruption with theft. Further, corruption without theft. Here, what happens is that the agent, say if you can use figures again, if you are supposed to pay 100,000 as the tax, the agent demands more than that, say 150. He gives the 100 to government and then he takes the 50. Okay? He takes the 50. So this is the corruption without theft. And this is really, this is really very common when the private individual wants to speed up things, wants to speed us up things. So the problem with this kind of thing, because really, I mean, who we'll would care after all, the individual, rather the agent is passing over a total sum to government. But then what happens is that these agents now try to make it a habit to appear as if the system is very slow, or, or it tries to slow the system, so as to what? To benefit from this. Okay? Now, I, I'm going to briefly talk about some models of what? Some forms of, of corruption with the government of, uh, societies. Here I give about four types of governments. One, is the one which is called uh, kleptocracy. Here, uh, corruption is entrenched in the highest level of government. But in a pure kleptocracy, the head of the government organizes a political system to maximize the possibilities to extract the lands and delegate them to personal use. Uh, a kleptocrat can expropriate property and extract wealth from private citizens through the threat of violence. Such rulers are likely to prefer a large state to maximize rent seeking. Okay? Thus, uh, even though they prefer to avoid waste of their subordinates, they may be unable to prevent them from shacking and taking bribes. Then, the other form is competitive bribe and states with the possibility of spirals. In some states, Many corrupt officials deal with a large number of ordinary citizens and farms. One of the problems is that there's a potential of upward spiral of corruption. So the corruption of some officials can encourage others to accept bribes. And the third is bilateral monopoly state. Here, a corrupt ruler faces a single major bribe. And these two share the possibilities of rent extraction. In some battle monopolies, rulers form alliance with the mafia, where a mafia is an organized crime group that provides protective services that, that an ordinary society are provided by the state. So in some cases, the state and mafia share the protective business. So corrupt rulers extort a share of the mafia's gains. At times, some states depend on a few farms that extract minerals. Now, such farms may form alliances with the country's rulers and share the wealth. Such a state becomes uh, an appendage or part of a larger investment in carrying distributive and fee losses and forfeiting the ability to tap the profits of the economic activity. So, what I'm meaning here is that uh, such a system. I make an alliance with the mafia group and then 
the mafia group stands out, the benefit and the say, for instance, you can believe it, but, uh, give away the government resources at a lower market value. So, in, at the end of the day, it's the government that is losing its profits. Then the fourth one is the mafia dominant state. Now, uh, this is a weak and disorganized with many officials engaged in freelance or open bribery. So the private group dominates the state by the cooperation of low level officials but unable to organize the state into a unified body. So because of the disorganization of the state, the private individual may not be able to access the benefit it wants because making an argument with one agent may not discourage another from coming forward. In other words, there is a fear that when I make an argument, or if I pay bread to this agent, another agent can work, or is coming. Okay. Now let's talk about the trends of profit in Uganda. Now below here, I provide data from Transparency International, uh, data on roughly all the countries in the world, and how they are ranked regarding corruption. Now here, uh, one, the first poll we will provide the rank, then you have the country, then the score, then you have the rank in 2011, and also rank in 2008. Now, uh, there are three countries, as per 2012, that uh, can consider corrupt free countries. You have uh, New Zealand, Denmark, and Finland. So all those three occupy the first slot, followed by Sweden. Maybe we should go to countries that we are very familiar with, the US and the UK. Uh, you, uh, Netherlands in that position, Canada still doing very well. And then, sorry. Uh, uh, those countries there. So you can look at the first column, that is the current position or rank as per corruption. Then we have Japan is 17th, uh, together with UK. And the US comes next, 19th position. These are the current rankings. So it has improved, if you look at the US, it has improved from 24th in 2011, and also 23rd in 08. Yes, like also the UK, they have somehow, uh, UK has dropped from 16 now to 17. Uh, France, so you can see all this, so far there is no African country. <laughs> so the best country in Africa is Botswana, in position number 30. So that's the, if you look at all Africa, then Botswana is the best country. Okay, or you can call it maybe the corrupt free. So it's the best time in Spain. And then we continue moving without another African country again, up to, I think Rwanda should be next, good. Rwanda comes as number 15 in the world. 39, Cape Verde, what's your one? Is Cape Verde there, number 39? Then you have what? <laughs> Mauritius, good. Number 43. I think I was more interested about Rwanda being our neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> so, we see Rwanda coming in under 50, which I think is number 4. And then she says, follows. Okay? I know you're waiting for your car also. So you have to do some good waiting. <laughs> do some good waiting. So you have Namibia there. So look at African countries, we have Uganda, number 64 in the world. Okay, then it sort of follows. Then Saudi Arabia, then South Africa, you can see where it is. 69 in the world. Okay, you can see our Italy, interesting. <laughs> okay, and then come to China, is there. Tunisia is 75. I know your eyes are waiting for you.